Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Russ Riesinger. The coronavirus outbreak continues to change by the minute with four Montana cases released last night. Three of those were right here in Yellowstone County. They were all people in their 20s. We're going to go live now to Riverstone Health, where Yellowstone County Health Officer and Riverstone Health President John Felton is meeting with the media after uh, making some uh, announcements, some amendments. Let's go ahead and listen to him right now. Including three more Yellowstone County residents, bringing the total of Montanans testing positive to 15 and the total of Yellowstone County residents to five. What makes today's announcement particularly sobering is that two of our community members who tested positive today or yesterday, work in health care. It is our understanding that these individuals were exposed to COVID-19 outside of the workplace. They were not exposed in their health care settings. In addition to the two people working in health care, the third positive yesterday is a worker in the Yellowstone County Detention Facility. Um, as with everyone who tests positive for COVID-19, our public health nurses are following up with these individuals to learn more about where they've been, their contacts, and other pertinent information that will help us in, in tracking this disease. Everyone who's tested positive for COVID-19 in Yellowstone County is at home, and we continue to wish them well as, as they're in their isolation period as they recover from their illness. It is true that older people and those with underlying health conditions are more susceptible to the more severe cases and consequences of COVID-19, but most of the people we're seeing in Montana who have tested positive are younger than 50. This disease is having serious ramifications across our entire nation. Not only is it affecting the, the health of our, our nation and its people, it's also affecting our financial health. The only thing that can bring us closer to the road to recovery is to slow the rate of infection. And one of the ways that we can do this is by taking action to limit the spread of disease by limiting the contact between people. In my capacity as Yellowstone County Health Officer, I am announcing today the extension of the order I issued earlier this week on Monday, March 16th. The new order is effective 8 a.m. Mountain Standard Time tomorrow, March 21st, and it extends through eight, um, April 11th, or April 10th, sorry, April 10th, 2020, at 11.59 p.m. As always, this order is subject to change based on um, changes in our very dynamic situation. I'm going to read for you now the elements of the new order, which again goes into effect tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., and will remain in effect through, uh, through April 10th. All restaurants, food courts, cafes, coffee houses, bars, brew pubs, taverns, breweries, microbreweries, distilleries, wineries, tasting rooms, special licenses, licensees, clubs, and casinos are subject to this, this closure. All food service operations, as before, are subject to the closure with, with the, the, the following exceptions. Those restaurants that um, serve dine-in customers, um, food services may continue and are encouraged to continue to provide takeout and delivery services. Food service establishments that serve a population that depends on it as one of their uh, sole sources of food, including university dining halls or cafeterias and hospitals and care facilities, room service in hotels, crisis shelters or similar institutions, airport concessionaires, and any facilities necessary for the response to the emergency, all of which may continue using necessary only personnel. It's also a significant expansion of the order. All fitness operations having indoor group programs, including but not limited to health clubs, health spas, aquatic centers, hot springs, fitness centers, gyms, fitness clubs, dance studios, gymnastics studios or schools, yoga studios, and the like. This does not include personal one-on-one -on -one training or instruction in such locations provided that no more than five persons are present and they're spaced at least six feet apart in any one operation at any one time. In addition, all massage and massage therapy establishments, practices and centers 
All theaters and entertainment venues, whether displaying film, live, video, or other format of entertainment, and whether indoor or outdoor. All group activity and recreational centers, including but not limited to indoor arenas, bingo halls, music halls, bowling alleys, and ice skating and roller skating rinks. All indoor play areas, including but not limited to trampoline parks, indoor climbing centers, discovery centers, and other child-related entertainment venues and activity, activity areas present in other venues. All church and religious services and group activities held in public venues, including all congregations ser and services at places of worship, including churches, synagogues, cathedrals, and the like. And all funeral establishments and activities, including graveside and memorial services. I'm aware that the governor issued an executive order earlier today, temporarily closing essentially the same list of establishments that my order does. I respect the governor's decision as to when his executive order will end, but in light of health care workers turning, testing positive, I have chosen to be more aggressive in my actions to slow down the spread of COVID-19. I wish things were different. There really is no way to help keep the community healthy and our health care system able to care for those who will become ill other than to spread or slow the spread of this virus. Unfortunately, temporarily, temporarily closing places where people tend to gather in large numbers is the only way that we can help those who care for us to do so. This is not business as usual. I don't know when we'll get to our new normal, but I know that we must get there. Temporarily closing businesses will help us recover. We have provided guidance to the complex and fast-moving food service establishments about steps they must take now to be ready for the new normal when we can reopen dine-in ser food services. Many other local businesses have already adopted new operating procedures to enhance social distancing and to protect themselves and their customers. Those businesses affected by today's order need to plan now for how they will change their operating processes so they can reopen in ways that protect their workers and their customers. I applaud and thank our local businesses who take seriously and act to contain this threat, unprecedented in our lifetime, to our collective health and well-being. Before I ask our Unified Health Command par hospital partners to describe the seriousness of this situation, not only for people infected with COVID-19, but also for the healthcare system, I would like to introduce Gina Lervick with the Yellowstone County Attorney's Office. In the last week, many have asked how it is that a health officer can close businesses without those businesses violating rules. Gina will help us understand the powers and duties of local health officers. Gina? Good afternoon. My name is Gina Lervick, and I am the Chief In-House Counsel for Yellowstone County. Uh, as mentioned, I know there are a number of questions about public health officers, how these orders come about, and I'm going to attempt to address them as best I can. I'm also going to attempt the feat of being the first attorney in the history of the world who actually means it when I say I'm going to be brief, I promise. <laughs> State law very clearly provides for a public health officer and what that officer's duties are. Uh, these orders, I will say, are not done lightly, and they're not done without a great deal of research and a great deal of authority that, that is, as I mentioned, clearly laid out. The legislature wanted the health officers to be wholly independent, um, separate from elected officials, and this is both to maintain independence, but also efficiency. Uh, as you know, public uh, elected officials have a great deal of process and procedure that they're obligated to take part in. And so the legislature intended for this public health officer to be able to make fast, intelligent decisions based on the needs of the public as a whole. The public health officer's duties and powers are specifically stated, and for those who are particularly interested, it's in Montana Code annotated section 50-2-118. There are five different duties and responsibilities that are laid out and generally they are that the health officer can inspect for conditions of public health importance and to order compliance with those, to report communicable diseases, and most importantly to us here, 
to, and I'll quote, take steps to limit contact between people in order to protect the public health from imminent threats, including but not limited to ordering the closure of buildings and facilities where people congregate and canceling events. The legislature very specifically provided for the types of orders that we're dealing with today. The other uh, duties and responsibilities of a public health official include reporting communicable diseases, establishing, maintaining quarantine and isolation measures, and pursuing actions with the court if necessary. And so here in Yellowstone County, Mr. Felton makes these decisions and does so with a great deal of resources. He has, of course, and as you'll hear, the resources of both hospitals as well as his own staff as he's CEO of Riverstone Health. A couple of brief things I did want to clarify about our public health officer's orders. Um, they're not impacted or reliant in any way on the Yellowstone County or city emergency declarations. Those are specifically to allow our government to obtain funds um, if possible and if necessary and uh, are wholly independent of any of the um, public health officer's orders. And the final note I wanted to touch on is Mr. Felton's orders are enforced by both the Sheriff's Office and the Billings Police Department and that it is a crime to violate them. I want to uh, specifically on my own be sure to thank Sp um, Sheriff Linder and Chief St. John and all of their employees for their tremendous efforts as this is uncharted territory and, and they've been doing tremendous. So, um, I want to urge our community to remember that every one of these officials talking to you is also a member of the community and has families and friends here and does not address you lightly in any way. So here to talk more about the virus itself, um, Dr. Michael Bush. Hi. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Bush. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at St. Vincent Healthcare, uh, as well as an almost 40-year career emergency physician. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that one of the things that I'm very proud of as we address this uh, current medical pandemic is that we are working together in this community with Riverstone Health, with our public health department, with the Billings Clinic, and with St. Vincent Healthcare, so that we know that all of us are working together uh, to meet the medical needs of the community because none of us can handle this alone. And so really appreciate that we are working, staying in alignment, and trying to manage this uh, very unknown situation. As we talk about the uh, COVID-19 or the novel coronavirus, uh, there's a lot of information and misinformation out in the public about what this thing really is. And in fact, I walked into my own hospital, had one of my own physician colleagues ask me just a week ago, don't you think that this is all a result of this being an election year? And I was... I, I was really kind of stunned because the issue really is this is a brand new virus that jumped from the animal world into the human population. We have no immunity that we have developed over time to this, so none of us in this room have immunity to this virus. Uh, it is very likely that well over the majority of the people that are listening to me sitting in this room will contact this virus and will acquire the illness. And I'll let Dr. Merchant talk a little bit more about the illness here in a minute. Uh, but the fact is this is real. And it becomes a numbers game for us and, and the number of potential illness. And so I did talk about this the last time I was up here and I want to reinforce that again today. Uh, and I'm sorry, this is, you know, there's not a good place for me to rest this here, sorry. Uh, but the uh, fact is that we still have a chance to prevent this overwhelming our health care system. And the things that we're talking about, making sure that we're doing the constant hand washing, making sure that you, you take care of those things. Again, as I said before, if you sing, sing through happy birthday to me twice, that's a good 20 seconds of the soap and water. And soap and water kill this virus. We know that. Uh, make sure <clears throat> you're cleaning the surfaces that you constantly touch. 
when you're walking in hallways or in the stairwell. Stick your hands in your pocket. Carry things with you. Carry your clipboard. Carry things with you so you're not grabbing things and touching things. Use your hips to open doors where you can. Uh, the social distancing and staying away from other people, and I know that's hard, uh, but those are things that really are important to limit the spread so we don't have overwhelming infection. You do, again, still want to be covering your cough, making sure that you are <clears throat> protecting others around you. And then if you are ill, stay home and do the self-monitoring, the self-quarantining isolation that's required. Another question that has come up is what are we as healthcare providers and healthcare institutions doing to protect the associates that work uh, in our institutions? And I would tell you that we are <clears throat> having these, uh, our associates monitoring for symptoms of illness, fever, cough, shortness of breath, asking them to stay home, work through our uh, uh, occupational health departments to get appropriate testing and, and recommendations of treatment. Uh, the PPE use is strict in making sure that we're appropriately protecting them in the right situations. And PPE, you know, both of all of us have been kind of conserving our PPE and doing things to make sure that we can get through any potential shortages as we come forward. Doing the cleaning that we need to do at home. Cohorting patients, so we're trying to keep these patients in similar locations, so same group of staff and other people that are very familiar with the processes to care for them. Uh, the other thing I would tell you about is there uh, would be things, personal checklists that people can do. And so as we're doing this, as the associates are making sure that they're reviewing the appropriate donning and doffing instructions about how to apply the PPE, how to put it on, how to use it. Uh, when they get into their vehicle at the end of the day before they touch anything inside the car, have hand sanitizer there, use that hand sanitizer before they, they start getting into the car. And then there's actually jokes out there about stripping on the porch. I'm not asking you to strip on the porch, but I am asking you to strip as soon as you get inside your house. And then take those clothes that you used as your work clothes, put them right in the washer so that they get washed right away with soap and water to kill them. And those are things that our associates can do uh, in terms of ways that they can, can help protect themselves and things we're doing to help protect them. There's a lot more involved in all these things, but at this point I'd like to actually turn it over to Dr. Bob Merchant. Bob has been a, a colleague and a friend for 30 years. Uh, currently uh, he is the chief medical officer for uh, Billings Clinic and he is, as I have 30 plus years of pulmonology and critical care experience physician. So. <laughs> So thank you. In, like like uh, Mike said, I'm pulmonary critical care. That means I specialize in treating lung disease and also taking care of people in the ICU. I've lived here for almost 30 years now. I can tell you this is a community that I love. It's just an absolutely phenomenal community. And we are in unprecedented times. In the past 30 years, I've not seen threats to this community like we're seeing right now. And I can't tell you how grateful that I am that we have the experts uh, at our county health department, our mayor, who are willing to understand these issues and take the needed actions to help out our community, to protect the people that we care about so much, to protect you all, to protect us. I did want to share a little bit about what this virus is. Again, this is uh, COVID-19 is the illness that we get. Some people call the virus COVID-19 also. Um, and it's, it's a new illness. It's a disease that first cropped up in December. So this is something that we are just learning about. Live in an incredible society that's been able to, uh, within a month, we have the genome identified. We're mapping out, we actually have a virus, a vaccine that's been developed, but there's gonna be a lot of testing six months, um, a year before we know if this vaccine is works and is released uh, to the public. So it's important that we understand what this disease is. There's confusion though, because this disease can seem like the, the like a cold, it can seem like the flu. And in fact, the symptoms are very similar to a cold or a flu. Uh, and when you see patients that have this disease, you, you, you would think that, yeah, that they've just got a cold, they've got the flu. 
It is more severe than that, though, uh, and that's the problem, that 80% of people do very well and they just have mild symptoms. There are some people that don't have any symptoms at all, but then there are some people, unfortunately, that get uh, critically ill from this and others that get severe disease. So we're talking maybe 5% of the people that come down with the illness end up in our ICU potentially on a ventilator. And some people uh, with even all our modern technologies, uh, some people succumb to it. Uh, the rate of that happening is about 10 times influenza. So influenza is a disease we take very seriously. This is something that's even more serious, and that's why we're worried about it. Combined with what Mike was talking about, this is a new disease, so none of us uh, as of today have immunity. This is what scares us in the medical community. Like I said, we've been, we're very fortunate in the society that we have that we're able to develop uh, understanding of this as quickly as we can. We're reaching out, each of our, uh, our hospitals are reaching out to uh, each other. I've got Mike on speed dial. We're constantly talking to each other, learning from each other. But we're also learning from our colleagues in Seattle, in Italy, in China, who are further along in the, the uh, epidemic and are understanding the consequences. And what they're telling us is there, if you don't take really aggressive measures to do the things that Mike says, to do the things that, uh, that the public health department is doing, to potentially uh, quiet the virus down, or and even if you do, there's a chance that it could overwhelm the health systems. And we are preparing for that. Uh, we spent the, the past several weeks, actually the past uh, month or so, uh, anticipating this. Some of the majors uh, that we're taking uh, were, we have closed uh, 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 our hospital to elective surgeries, and uh, St. Vincent's is also uh, doing the same. Uh, we are also uh, deferring uh, elective clinic visits. We want to be able to uh, do that for two reasons. One, provide social isolation, not bring people into areas of disease, uh, where I'm sorry, where disease can spread, uh, but also to make sure that resources can be reallocated. What we're doing is we're taking those uh, professionals that are uh, would have been doing that work and assigning them other jobs. Uh, we are getting ready to expand our ICU. Uh, we've got increased ventilators availability. Uh, uh, Mike uh, tells me they're doing exactly the same thing. We're trying to match and make sure that we're achieving the same goal so that we can care for the entire community. Uh, together. So there's been a lot of work uh, that we've been doing to uh, prepare for this. We're hoping we're going to be able to flatten the curves so that we don't see the type of illnesses that this type of uh, overwhelming uh, uh, effects on the health system that have been seen in Seattle, that have been seen, in, that are being seen currently in New York, uh, that are seen in Italy. Um, but we need to work collaboratively uh, together. So again, this is really unprecedented times. Uh, I don't, it's definitely not a time to panic because we've got a lot of information that we're, we have that gives us insights as to how to manage this, but it is time to take this very seriously. And I can't tell you again how appreciative I am uh, that our public health department is taking this seriously, that our mayor, our city is taking this seriously, and our, uh, the entire medical community is uh, working collaboratively. So. What I'd like to do now is open up for questions. I'm sorry, sorry. Kayla, this is, Bar this is Barbara. We're going to hand it back to John. My apologies. I didn't know the sequence, so my apologies. Thank you all. Um, so I think what you just heard from, from Dr. Bush and Dr. Merchant is really that um, the option of doing nothing is, cannot be a, a, an option. We can't rewind the clock. We can't go back to before this novel coronavirus is identified um, and, and pretend like it's not going to happen. All we can do is do the very best we can to slow the rate of infection. One of the ways that we can do this is to extend the health officer order until April 10th of 2020. Uh, like the initial order that I issued on Monday, uh, this order is subject to change uh, as we go through the situation and, and the, the dynamics change. This is not easy. Um, it is not lost on me that the consequences of this order affect not only your friends and neighbors, they affect my friends and neighbors. We're a community and we're all 
um, being impacted by this virus and by the response to try and prevent its, its widespread. I applaud and appreciate Governor Bullock's leadership in, in waiving the waiting time for unemployment benefits and for making available low interest loans for affected businesses. And we also know that aid from the federal government is, is forthcoming. If conditions change and, and I'm able to lift this order, I will do so. In the meantime, I urge everyone to stay home as much as you can, to wash your hands thoroughly and often, avoid touching your face, uh, avoid handshakes and hugs, cover your cough and sneeze with the tissue, and frequently clean those high-touch surfaces um, like desks and tabletops and things like that with the disinfectant. On behalf of our entire Unified Health Command, I wish all those Montanans infected with COVID-19, especially our fellow healthcare workers, a speedy recovery. As I've said many times from, from here, this situation is truly unprecedented. We are in uncharted waters. But all of us need to remember one thing. This will end. We're among the most resilient people in, on, on the most resilient nation on the planet. We've survived civil war, world wars, pandemics, economic disaster, and terrorist attacks. By working together, we will survive and we will again one day know a life dominated by family and friends and activities that are not related to COVID-19. I'm confident that one day we will look back at this time and remember how we came together as a community to protect and preserve the way of life that we all love. With that, we'll now open it up for questions. Kayla, you had one? Oh, yeah, I think. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, you're good. Okay. Um, so you said that a few of the counties confirmed COVID-positive cases. Um, they worked in the healthcare system. And how do you know that the exposure was outside the healthcare setting? So the question was, how are we confident that the exposure for the two healthcare workers was outside the, the healthcare setting? The process of following up on a confirmed infectious disease is to identify um, contacts that a person had and when we identify the, a, a contact with a known infectious source, then the, the far and away likelihood is that is the source of this infection. You also look at the timeline between when that contact happened and when symptoms began to arise. So all those factors together um, clearly indicate that, that these two individuals were, were infected outside their work setting. Can you tell us any more about where they might have been or what situation surrounded that? Um, they appear to have been connected with the Board of Regents meeting that several others have also been um, associated with. Okay. And could you elaborate a little bit on what these two individuals do within healthcare? No, as a matter of privacy, um, we are not going to get into where these individuals work, what they do. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty small town, and, and everyone deserves their privacy. So we won't get into any details ever about, um, uh, about patients beyond the most generalized details. Okay, thank you. You bet. Mr. Felton, your, uh, your order doesn't uh, mention public schools, but are you recommending that the schools in Yellowstone County be closed at least until April 10th as well? No, the schools are currently under uh, Governor Bullock's order and we'll continue to work closely with them to determine what happens when that order expires. Uh, much depends on what the governor chooses to do as March 27th arises. So we're in very close contact with the school. We work closely with them. But in terms of, of what happens next, that's really, um, at this point, it's a governor's question. What effect, if any, will the ambient temperature raise as we get into spring how on the virus? Um, I, I, I think um, really at this point we don't know. Uh, this is a virus that, as, as was said by Dr. Merchant and Dr. Bush, um, the first cases were identified three months ago. So we don't have a history of what happens when, um, when temperatures change, when seasons change. We don't know how seasonal it is. Um, and I think that's, that is really part of the understanding of what it means to be in a truly unprecedented situation is this is something that is brand new. And there is no experience to tell us. Um, there was a question here. Yes. Yeah, I have a few general questions. Um, so what's the capacity for hospitalizations? Um, and how do you think that's going to be 
hospital bed in the county, and what is the public health office doing to make sure it's not proper capacity and preparation for stress on this system? So I, I'll speak to the, the second question, and I'll let my hospital colleagues speak to the first. Um, as the Unified Health Command, we all work closely and we share information to understand what our capacities are, what our resources are, and we view those as a community. And so that's how we keep, that, that's how we try to maintain a community basis of, of understanding. Um, in terms of specifics related to capacity, I'll turn that over to my hospital colleagues. So the capacity question is an excellent question, uh, but I'm going to reframe it a little bit because really what we're doing at both our, our facilities and around this uh, region is preparing for caring for respiratory problems. So we are in the process of the reason that we're uh, closing to elective surgeries and other cases is so that we can really have that capacity for these respiratory problems. And so it's really, I think we've got plenty of hospital capacity. It's more of the ICU beds and both our organizations are looking at potentially more than doubling or tripling our ICU bed uh, capacity. And then we are also looking at our regional partners, our critical access uh, hospital partners, to take care of more of the non-respiratory problems that can be taken care of at those other facilities. And just to build a little bit on what Bob, what Bob was talking about, it's not just the physical capacity or the number of ventilators we have, but it's the capacity of our staff. And uh, again, this is unprecedented times, and I think we're creating different care models so that uh, people that wouldn't normally be taking care of these patients actually have what they need to take care of them under a team setting, other kinds of ways of looking at it. And that's something that, that we're all doing and talking about so that we can add, actually manage the needs of our community. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, in, in terms of personal protective equipment, um, what's sort of the inventory numbers countywide for those specifically? And is anyone sort of tracking them countywide? What is that like? Yeah. So, again, it, it, that's a function of univer uh, the Unified Health Command. We have a an overall inventory of the key pieces of personal protective equipment that are available um, through our, our three um, major organizations. We also monitor, if you will, the burn rate. How quickly are we going through that, those materials? Um, with the, the county um, declaration of the emergency, that has allowed us to get into the process of, of, of accessing um, the state stock, uh, stocks that are available. And so um, we're working through the process of, of uh, obtaining those, providing information to obtain those additional resources. It, it's really important to, to remember that we need to look at this from a long-term perspective. Uh, much as, as Drs. Merchant and Bush have talked about hospital beds, the question really isn't, do we have enough beds and ICU beds and personal protective equipment for today? The real question is, how do we how do we have enough to last through the long term? And the answer to that is we have got to s slow down the spread of infection so that we don't have mass numbers of patients requiring hospitalization and extensive use of those materials. Um, time is our friend in this, and so our efforts uh, throughout the community through the Unified Health Command are really intended and designed to slow down that spread. We are not going to stop the spread. We need to slow it down and avoid those high, high peaks of, of mass disease. As we move forward, is there a chance your order could be modified to uh, address retail, specifically grocery stores, and what would that look like and what would that mean? Um, I would, you know, grocery stores are clearly an essential service. People have to be able to get food. Um, so there, there's some possibility that we may, there may be a need to modify certain things, but I don't see that we'd be in a situation of actually closing grocery stores. That would, that would really disrupt the food supply so dramatically that it, it would be untenable. John, a uh, question. I know you don't have a crystal ball, but other communities have seen a consistent rate of increase until 
the social distancing and other uh, measures kick in, and then that rate of increase starts to drop off. Uh, as best you can in the next week or two, what would you expect? In particular, would you expect to see a consistent rate of increase until what point might we see some uh, change in that uh, rate of increase? Uh, you know, we, we don't have much more than what, we, what other communities have observed. Um, and, and there's some variability in that de that depends somewhat on how aggressively you address these, these prevention and, and, um, and measures or containment measures to reduce the spread. What we would absolutely expect to see is more cases, more confirmed cases. We're doing more testing. Um, the virus is circulating. We know that. Um, what, the, the two things that we need to watch very carefully are what is the total number of of positive cases and then the ratio of positive cases, but also what's the burden on inpatient service? Um, we really need to watch those two things. Uh, the Pretty much every community ahead of us ha will tell us that we have more cases coming. We just need to expect that. Our goal here, again, is not to get to zero cases, which would be wonderful. It's just not going to happen. The real goal is to slow down that spread and avoid overwhelming our, our system and our resources. Do we have any more questions from the media? Okay, Mari. Um, so, what does preparation kind of look like right now um, preparing for in case patients need to be moved around the state? And who's been involved in that conversation? What is that? So I'm going to largely turn that over to, to my hospital colleagues because they're the ones that need to make those patient decisions. Um, from a public health perspective, we are working with um, the, uh, the governor's office and the state health department to ease that process, to make it a little faster and a little simpler. But in terms of the actual movement of patients, my, my colleagues here can handle that one. So a few different uh, things that, that play into that. Number one is a lot of these patients, by the time they need to come to Billings to the care of either of the hospitals here, very well may be very sick and, and need to be on breathing machines, something like that. And so, uh, you know, we do have... Uh, flight resources, uh, medical evacuation teams. Uh, we have worked through uh, FAA concerns, and uh, none of us own the air aircraft that we fly. And so we had to work with the vendors, uh, but those things have all been resolved so that we can transport patients with, with aircraft. Uh, ground transport, uh, again, resources are limited in rural Montana, uh, and uh, we'll have to work through that. We've got some things we're discussing and talking about. Uh, and then, again, I think Dr. Merchant was talking about this earlier, that we have to be working with our rural partners uh, so that we can support the work that they can do for certain patients in their own communities, and then how do we support that and, and, and make sure we're doing our best to take care of central and, and uh, eastern Montana. So. Okay, if there are no more questions from the media. Um, actually, I was hoping for a clarification. This is Kayla. Um, the, the two healthcare workers who have COVID-19, the region meeting that you were talking about before, the, the Board of Regents meeting, is that the same one in Dillon that has been associated with these other cases? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. Thank you all for coming. We'll continue to keep you apprised as this situation changes. All right, we just heard from Yellowstone County Health Officer John Felton and two other doctors from each of our hospitals, some very strong words there. They updated us on the coronavirus outbreak here in Yellowstone County. Five people have tested positive here in Yellowstone County. Two of those work in health care. They were exposed outside the workplace. We're told the third is a detention officer there at the Yellowstone County Detention Center. Felton saying that the only way that we can get back to recovery is to slow the spread of this. He says it is going to spread, but it is imperative that we uh, stop the, uh, the uh, slow the spread of it. He, so he's extended some uh, closures with establishments and everything. That now goes until April 10th. Gyms are included in that. 
church services are now included in that as well. So we're going to have much more on that coming up today at 530 on Q2 News. Stay tuned for that and also for the CBS Evening News at 5 o'clock.